to you, David. Thanks a lot, Dan. Um, and thank you very much, everyone, for coming along. Um, so yeah, um, welcome to the Virtual University of Birmingham. My name is David Gange, and it's my pleasure to introduce you to the history department and to the single honours history degree in particular. Um, so the first thing I want to do is to acknowledge the strange and challenging times that we're living in and to tell you a little bit about how we're adapting to those. So we obviously expect and hope that all teaching will be back to normal by September 2021 and that we'll be able to welcome you to our beautiful campus in person and to teach all of you entirely face to face. But this summer we're redirecting our efforts throughout the whole department from any kind of research commitments to our teaching in order to develop everything we need to be able to fully support face-to-face -face learning with um, online teaching too, so that anyone who's shielding or can't be on campus can have full access to all their teaching resources. So we've been having daily Zoom meetings um, to familiarize each other with all the different modules we teach, so that if any staff member should become ill, there'll be at least two different staff members who could step into their shoes and deliver their classes without any disruption. Um, this has actually been a really, really great pleasure for all of us, bringing the department community really close together and teaching all of us lots about each other's work. And it will mean that our department has a degree of resilience um, that has never been required from us before. Um, okay, so I want to begin by saying a little about um, what doing history means and about um, how we approach um, these kind of things at Birmingham. Um, and I want to do this through a quote. It will be the only quote that I use, but I think it's quite a useful one. Um, and it's a quote from someone who some of you might be familiar with, possibly. I'll leave a picture there for just a brief moment. Um, you can think about whether you might be or not. You can find out who she is. Um, but then I will show the picture um, that reveals to you how it is that I think some people might know her. She's the voice of pilot from The Incredibles. But as well as that, she's also interested in history in some ways that I think are really, really interesting. Um, so here is the quote. She says, just the other day, I was in my neighborhood Starbucks, waiting for the post office next door to open. I was enjoying a chocolatey cafe mocha when it occurred to me that to drink a mocha is to gulp down the entire history of the new world. From the Spanish exploitation of Aztec cacao and the Dutch invention of the chemical process for making cocoa, on down to the capitalist empire of global chocolatiers and the lifestyle marketing of Starbucks itself. The modern mocha is a bittersweet concoction of imperialism, genocide, invention, and consumerism served with whipped cream. So what she's interested in is the way that history can be used to unlock the world around us, to find meanings, kind of exciting and also extremely difficult histories um, in even the most, even the simplest and most everyday things like that mocha. And also to see the global connections in the past and in the present that bind each of us to people that we might not realize we're connected to. And as I show you slides in a few moments, introducing you to the kinds of modules that we teach you, you'll see those kinds of things appear, never kind of treating a bit of history in isolation, but showing the links between the global south and global north, and dealing in real detail with the legacies of imperialism and other kind of defining factors of our global histories. Um, and one thing I want to stress with this in ways that are clearer today than ever before is that the questions that history deals with are among the biggest and most important questions that we can ask. Questions like why some countries are rich and others aren't. Um, these are questions that you can't possibly understand without historical knowledge. There are different ways you might approach them, that an economic historian might look at kind of big structural questions, or a cultural historian might look at um, ideologies and the kind of ideas behind things like imperialism. Um, but there's no way we could answer a question like that without, um, without thinking through historical, social knowledge, and without being inventive with the different kinds of histories that we can use. So one thing that we're aiming to do with history degree at Birmingham is to equip you with ways of asking those kinds of questions that can send you out into the world as engaged citizens um, with ways of understanding why the world we live in is like it is and how it became that way, making you able to comprehend and shape um, the society around you. 
Um, and that's one of the kind of defining factors of a history degree, really, I think, is that you're dealing with information that people kind of embrace because they're really interested in it. It's a kind of thing um, to do because you love it. But at the same time, it's both really important knowledge and really important skills um, of the kind that employers really love. So the things that you're being taught in a history degree, kind of analytic skills, communication skills, training in processing data, and in understanding kind of different perspectives on the world, um, those are what you get in a history degree. And they're also the kinds of things that bring um, graduate recruiters every single year um, to history departments. We're really lucky in history in that we have a career service office within the history department. Um, so those kind of links between graduate employers and the history department um, work very, very effectively indeed. So I'll say a tiny bit now about the department, who we are, um, and how that shapes your experience. So you might well have noticed that we're a really, really big history department, one of the biggest in the UK. Quite unusual for a department to have more than 50 full-time academic staff. And that kind of means certain things for you. One of the things it means is that we're able to offer a really enormous range of historical choices. We cover um, a really kind of large proportion of the globe, um, all continents except Antarctica, um, and lots and lots of different um, periods of history in those places too. And we have a really, really large student body. We're a very, very big historical community. Um, so yeah, in terms of our coverage, we're unusual in the UK in having both an expert in medieval China and an expert in modern China. Um, and yeah, that, that coverage is um, unusually large. Um, but of course, being that big comes with challenges too, in terms of making sure that all of our students feel like they're part of a post historical community. And the way we do that is through our centres. We have seven centres within the department, including things like Centre for Medieval History, Centre for Modern British Studies, um, Centre for Global History. And these groups um, invite speakers from the rest of the UK and from around the world to come and speak to us um, each week. And um, they coordinate all kinds of different historical activities going on. And so they're a really important part of what we do for making sure everyone feels like part of the community. Um, and they are kind of one indication of the way in which at somewhere like Birmingham, your kind of core teaching hours, the kind of um, eight or nine hours of classroom teaching that you would get every week, they're only a really small part of what this historical community offers you. Um, only a really small part of your experience of um, engaging with history and doing your degree. Um, <clears throat> another kind of um, defining feature of who we are um, is that at any university like Birmingham, you are learning from people who have kind of devoted their lives, devoted their careers to research in precisely the things that they are teaching. So never from people who are kind of just learning that material in a book the week before or something like that. We are kind of passionately engaged in all of the material that you learn about. Um, and every five years, the research of each university department is measured by something called the Research Excellence Framework. And last time round in this, Birmingham came top in the UK. So that's significant in one way, and it shows you that we're engaged in, in doing all this research um, in ways that are judged to be excellent, um, but also because this is one of the ways in which resources are given out to universities. So it's because of success in this that we've been able to expand the number of staff that we have at points where other universities have been contracting. So straight away, we um, employed an expert in Brazil, which is somewhere we didn't have a historian of. Um, but we also decided to devote some of the resources that we got from that to actually making sure we were really improving our student experience. So the money coming in from research being used to directly help our students. So over the last few years, we've introduced lots of different things. Um, just note, kind of teaching excellence framework, gold standard two, um, which was, um, yeah, in which, which um, noted in particular our um, expanding learning environment both on campus and online as well. 
Um, so yeah, the, the money from the Research Excellence Framework um, was used to expand several fields of what we do for students, in particular in employing two well-being officers within the department. So most universities now have a well-being departments um, that students will go to um, to get assistance, but we decided to employ two within the history department itself so that, yeah, they're familiar faces to people, um, so that the well-being officers understand precisely what's going on in the history department to respond to. Um, they're really, really helpful in making sure that any personal issues students have, um, they have assistance with, in making sure that any students who have disabilities don't have um, their ability to go about their degree um, compromised by those disabilities. Um, so I think they're a really important um, shift over the last few years. Um, when you come arrive in Birmingham History Department 2, you will be given a personal tutor. It's another way that we um, make sure that it's easy for you to engage really closely with the department beyond your teaching. Um, the personal tutor is someone you can go and see um, every single week if you want to. You don't have to, but they put aside two hours each week for their personal tutors to pop in and have a chat, just make sure things are going okay. You can talk about your ideas for your essays. You can talk about the feedback that you've been given for previous essays, and they can help you kind of understand that. We also have things like an academic writing advisory service, which helps with the actual um, construction of essays at the level of um, improving your writing style um, rather than of the content of those essays themselves. So I would just finish by saying a little bit about the actual structure of the degree. Um, there might be the questions in a moment about how this relates to joint honours too. Feel free to ask those. Um, so this is the structure of the first year. And these structures, I'm aware, don't actually mean that much until we talk through them, but hopefully you can help you make sense of them. Um, so in the first year, you really have two main types of modules. So practicing history A and B, um, they are the modules that teach you the skills of being a historian. Um, essay writing skills, research skills, how to footnote an essay effectively, just to make sure that you know um, how writing an essay works, what's expected of you, and you're um, really kind of developing your, your technique as a historian. Um, and alongside those, we have the big survey courses, like discovering the Middle Ages or the making of the contemporary world. So the purpose of these is to introduce you to all of the biggest events and processes in kind of world history, to give you a really big framework of historical knowledge into which all the more specialized things you do later on will fit. So they're your kind of backdrop for all your detailed knowledge later on. And they also um, introduce you to lots of our different lecturers. So you can um, begin to be deciding what kinds of bits of history you're most interested in yourself. And then um, the last part of your third year, another part of your third year, first year, sorry, um, is a new module that we've introduced this year called People and Places, which is giving you a taste of the kind of very kind of focused research work that you do later on. It's introducing you to kind of really in-depth historical work. So it will deal with um, a very, very small number of people, maybe a particular community, um, or a very, very particular place, um, often ones around the Birmingham area so that you can go and do kind of really detailed research in them. Um, and yeah, that's just to, to, to make sure that your first year is a kind of really rounded introduction to all the different kinds of things that you need. The first year is the only point in your degree where, you, where we ask that you um, study some kind of specific bits of history. So everyone does some medieval history and some modern history in their first year. After that, your freedom of choice really kicks in and you can decide to either focus your whole degree on a particular period, your favorite one, or you can decide to make yourself as wide a ranging historian as you like, um, kind of like Oliver has done, as he will uh, explain in a moment, um, and kind of um, take as many different options from all over the place as you want. So the second year, um, the kind of titles of the modules in the second year um, are even vaguer and I will explain why that is in a moment. So thematic option A, for instance, might not mean much, um, but this is a list of the choices that you would get for um, something like thematic option A. So you would um, choose a particular module on a bit of history that you're interested in. You'll see these are 
kind of really wide ranging, lots of different um, parts of the world covered and lots of different time periods as well. Um, and yeah, also lots of modules that speak directly to um, some of the kind of big questions that our society is confronting. So for instance, the module there, There is Black in the Union Jack, an introduction to Black and South Asian British history, um, kind of making sure that our kind of history curriculum is representative in that way, kind of decolonizing aspects of, of it is a really important thing to us. Um, one of the people who wrote the Royal Historical Society's report on race and ethnicity, Dr. Sadia Qureshi, is um, one of our lecturers. So we're very closely engaged in um, questions that are kind of very important to a lot of people um, at the moment. Um, and another thing that happens as you're moving from your first year to your second and your third is that the amount of teaching that you get in small groups and in seminars um, increases too. So in the first year, the teaching is about half and half lectures and seminars. In the second year, um, modules are introduced like group research in which you'll be in a group of five or six students in kind of very small groups working closely with a member of staff to create and do a research project. Um, and the number of lectures increases, I mean decreases you go through so that by the third year um, your teaching is entirely seminar based or one-to-one -one with a member of staff. So the, the biggest part of your third year is kind of your bit of um, personal research, the dissertation, where you work very closely one-to-one -one with a member of staff in putting a project together, researching it and writing kind of your crowning achievement of your degree. Um, and alongside that, you do a special subject, again, in small groups, um, which is about getting your hands dirty with primary sources too. So by this point, you're, you're no longer kind of learning about history, you're actually doing history, practicing it like a historian would. Um, and that yeah, makes the third year a really kind of rewarding experience for people, I think. Um, so it's just one more thing that I will mention before I hand over to Oliver, which is um, the, the year abroad. So there is an option to do a year abroad between your second year and your third year. Um, that time is far enough away um, from us now, I think, for, um, for us not to need to consider kind of the COVID impact on this yet. Um, but um, every student who gets a 2-1 or above in their first year is eligible to apply for the year abroad. Um, we have agreements with lots and lots of different universities. So one open day recently, I was asked if, to name the US universities that we have agreements with, and I couldn't. Um, I wasn't sure. So I went to speak to the person who um, runs the year abroad scheme a couple of days later to ask him, and he, he said, um, well, of course you couldn't name them, there are over 70. So we have, yeah, lots and lots of these agreements in places where um, English is the language of um, universities like Australia, New Zealand, um, Canada, and the US, but also in places like Spain and Russia and Germany and Italy, um, where if you already have that language, you would be able to um, pursue your study um, through that if you wanted. Okay, so I think I've probably um, gone on for long enough now and should hand straight over to Oliver to give you um, a student's eye perspective on this. But do be thinking about what kinds of questions um, you would like to ask in a few minutes time. Thank you very much.